Hey guys, it's Rishab here, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about nuclear deterrence today. Uh, just briefly to sort of give you guys um, like a structure of the presentation, it's going to be in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about the history and background of uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence in general, and then I'm going to get into deterrence theory and how it's sort of evolved over the last like four or five decades. It's really important to have this background knowledge uh, in terms of just like have like having the knowledge, but also uh, in a debate context, just because these sort of things will come up during cross X, it's important to know how things like deterrence theory work because a lot of pieces of solvency evidence that I've uh, seen when like looking through the topic literature also refer to like very very uh, specific terms that it's uh, important to understand in order for you to effectively like refute them or even question them in round. So, um. First, we'll start talking about like the history of nuclear weapons. The first nuclear weapons were created during the Manhattan Project. This was the atomic bomb created uh, around the 1940s. And these atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. This is the only time that nuclear weapons have been used. The atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had a 15 to 20 kiloton explosion. Today, uh, there's a cast like the one of the bombs that we've recently tested called the we meaning the U.S. called the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb has a 15,000 kiloton explosive capacity, which just goes to show you how uh, like how much more devastating nuclear weapons have gotten in like the last half century. Um, in terms of countries that have nuclear weapons, there's nine states that are considered nuclear states. Uh, and those are US, Russia, UK, France, China, Israel, India, and North Korea. And as you can see in the figure, I, uh, sorry, and Pakistan as well. And as you can see in the figure I provided, the US like around the 50s was like really uh, taking ahead. And then as the 70s and 80s came, the Soviet Union really started building up. And in the last about approximately two decades, I want to say, there's been like a steady decline in terms of uh, the number of um, warheads that each state uh, possesses. Yeah, so now I just uh, sort of wanted to talk about the nuclear revolution in uh, warfare. And the reason why nuclear weapons are so prominent is because they have, not prominent, but so relevant, is because they have really changed the way that warfare operates. And uh, this boils down to like three major reasons. The first one is catastrophic and widespread damage in a short time frame. There's a much longer period of time, if you have a much longer period of time, over uh, where devastation occurs, this allows states to more closely consider the atrocities that are occurring and come to settlements uh, prior to more devastation. For instance, during World War II, tens of thousands of lives were lost, but because that was over an extended period of time, states were able, states had a lot of time in between to sort of intervene before more lives could be lost in order to come to peace settlements. Whereas with nuclear weapons, if a bomb was dropped today and like millions of people were killed, there would be, there would not be that in-between time period where there could sort of be some intervention by policymakers in order to prevent more, like, prevent more future devastation. The second uh, primary change that nuclear weapons have brought out in the, in warfare is that it has changed the primary targets from combat, uh, from combatants to civilians. The reason why this is very relevant is because this is a violation of just war theory, right? This is something that is inherent to nuclear weapons. When you launch a nuke, you, like, you are intending to devastate a civilian population because that, that, like, the nuclear weapons are designed to cause mass devastation over a large, over a large chunk of area and impose great costs on another state, right? Uh, the way that is done is through launching them in places like cities that would cause like mass atrocities. And the third, re uh, third reason why nukes have changed warfare completely are because there's no clear winner. So if the US was to launch a nuke at a weaker state like North Korea tomorrow, North Korea can still retaliate with a second strike and cause mass damage to a point where the US wouldn't try to strong arm North Korea even if they were way more powerful than them. So this means that like the fact that there's no clear winner in war uh, sort of proves that the calculus of war has been altered, right? Even if one uh, country is significantly more powerful, has a way better economy than another country, doesn't necessarily mean it's more powerful. Just because e that weaker state still has a very devastating weapon that could impose a great cost on uh, 
a superpower like the United States. Now I'm sort of going to get into deterrence theory itself and sort of explain you uh, some of the terminology used in terms of like nuclear war and how states uh, make decisions on these levels. So first I sort of wanted to uh, distinguish two terms, defense and deterrence. Uh, the difference is here highlighted on the PowerPoint. Defense is action-based, whereas deterrence is based on threats, right? So what I mean by defense is action-based is that I mean that um, an actor prevents behavior. Defense is when an actor prevents behavior that it deems harmful through action that hinders or stops that behavior. The difference between defense and deterrence is that deterrence is based on threats. Deterrence is when an actor prevents harmful beer, a behavior not by taking action to stop it, but by threatening retaliation. So a good example that sort of highlights this in everyday life is cheating, right? Uh, professors in classrooms, professors and teachers use defense and deterrence as, uh, as a means to combat cheating. They will ha do things like have proctors patrolling the classroom, which is... Uh, like, which is an attempt to hinder cheating, right? It's an attempt to stop that behavior. Uh, whereas they also use deter, uh, like, uh, methods of deterrence, like suspension, right? Which just imposes a cost on an action, right? It, it sort of, uh, it, it, it sort of, uh, imposes a cost that the actor, i.e. the student, has to take into their decision-making calculus when deciding whether to cheat or not, right? The risk is that, the person could get suspended. Ideally, uh, these two things aren't mutually exclusive, so you can use them together to the point where you have multiple means of sort of defending slash, I guess, minimizing is a better word, uh, minimizing cheating. So uh, we'll take the same concept of defense and deterrence and apply it onto, uh, in like, in terms, in the context of nuclear warfare. So uh, just like we talked about defense, uh, defensive capabilities are sort of the parallel. They involve the ability an actor has to limit the harm that an adversary can inflict, inflict on it, right? And uh, punitive capabilities are deterrence. They involve the power to punish and cause harm. So in nuclear warfare, we have both. We have defensive capabilities and punitive capabilities. We use defense and deterrence as a means of minimizing uh, the risks and harms associated with nuclear warfare. An example of defensive capabilities are an anti-ballistic missile system. Uh, this is basically just a system that shoots down nuclear weapons if they come close to a state border, uh, sort of preventing that nuclear weapon from hitting a target and actually causing mass devastation. And uh, an example of a punitive capability is simply the ability to launch a nuclear counterattack, i.e. Uh, ensuring that even if someone launches a nuclear weapon, at a state, that state has the ability to have nuclear weapons that aren't destroyed and are able to be sent back. This will sort of impose a cost or sort of, impo uh, sor sort of impose a threat on the other country, which they have to internalize into their decision-making calculus before making the choice to do things like launch nuclear weapons. Now we'll talk a bit about mutually assured destruction, which is sort of the thesis of nuclear deterrence, the reason why uh, nuclear nuclear deterrence is sort of something that is viewed as uh, potentially causing peace. So mutually assured destruction is the idea that full-scale use of nuclear weapons by two or more opposing sides would cause the complete annihilation of both the attacker and the defender. Mutually assured destruction depends on something called second strike capabilities, uh, which I define in this slide, uh, slide here. It's simply just the ability to survive a first strike nuclear attack with enough warheads to launch a devastating counterattack. It's sort of similar to what I was talking about in this previous slide about having the punitive capability to launch a nuclear counterattack even after uh, one's adversary has launched an attack against you. The reason why uh, mutually assured destruction is... Uh, heavily debated topic is because there's a dilemma that comes with it of fear and peace. Nuclear weapons can inflict a ton of harm, but at the same time, they maintain peace because each state has to be extremely cautious of their actions because the consequences of like potentially launching an attack are ma are massive, right? Because if the other state lost, launches a counterattack, then the initial state who started the nuclear war uh, would, fa like, would face great losses. Therefore, it's sort of 
puts both states at a standstill and makes it so that they have to act in a way more cautious way uh, in order to avoid mass catastrophe. The there there's also a couple ways that are um there's there's a couple ways uh it, the second the second strike capabilities concept might seem a bit vague to you here it might feel weird um because a lot a lot of questions that come up with second strike capabilities is how do you, like how do you maintain it do you just um spread out where your nuclear weapons are across your state like in totally different locations and stuff and i mean at the end of the day yes you can uh but there's more strategic ways that states have gone about sort of um ensuring that they have second strike uh, capabilities and this is sort of referred to as the nuclear triad which is uh these three weapons primarily that are the bullet points on this slide the first one is intercontinental ballistic missiles this is basically just a guided ballistic missile with a minimum range of 5500 kilometers uh which can be launched uh, uh, as a second strike uh the second weapon is the strategic bomber the bombers are used to debilitate an enemy's ability to launch nuclear weapons so these are actually used in order to uh prevent um an enemy from having a second strike and the third weapon used in the nuclear triad are the submarine launched ballistic missiles slbms and these are basically ballistic missiles that are capable of being launched from submarines uh the reason why these are so good is because it's easier to be elusive and it's easier to maintain second strike capabilities with them because when you have access to water you can keep them in various places where it might be harder to get things like overhead uh overhead images of or satellite images of uh which countries can often do to sort of track where uh certain states are holding their nuclear arsenal but yeah so that's pretty much it for uh just a short primer on uh nuclear deterrence and the history of nuclear war i hope this was helpful in terms of giving you guys like a good base uh background knowledge on the history of nuclear weapons, sort of how they've evolved, and how nuclear deterrence works today. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to message me whenever, and I will also uh, send out a document with more in-depth explanations and more links to readings on nuclear deterrence theory, because it is a very rich subject.